references to bereath or covenant in the Old Testament, the Atheke, New Testament. Find them. Do what I did. I encourage you. Read every single one of them. Go ahead. Read them all. I hope you do. And I hope in reading them all that you try to just simply put them into the categories in which the Bible puts them. Now, what I want to try to come up with after the survey, you see here I have a sheet, a handout sheet called Biblical Concept of a Divine Covenant. What is a covenant? That's what I want to attempt to address in this hour. What is a covenant? What is a covenant? Now, if you take a look at these 50 texts in the Old Testament and these 10 texts in the New Testament, I think you got a pretty good idea of what a covenant is. Okay? What I would like you to try to do, although I'm prepared to do it for you, but you could do it on your own, go through these 60 texts and show from these 60 texts that a covenant is a sworn commitment that a covenant is a verbal commitment, that a covenant is a commitment of favor in friendship, donation or gift, and peace. Go ahead. Go through there and pick out the texts that show it. I mean, that's what I've tried to do. In summary, a covenant, a sworn verbal commitment, is an oath. An oath of favor is what's called a pledge. These were in covenant or confederate with Abraham. They were, they, were, they were possessors of Abraham's pledge, literally. That's literally what it says. They were possessors of Abraham's oath-bound commitment. They were possessors of Abraham's pledge. I wonder if I wrote that passage down in here. I don't know if I did it. Probably it's not there because this was done, this was typed up for me by Steve in the... Um, and uh, Oh, yeah, men with men. Men with men. No, I didn't write down men with men. So I'm going to find it from this bigger list. I know where it is. I mean, it's in, it's in Genesis 14. Now, here it is. Genesis 14, 13. These were confederate with Abraham. And the Hebrew indicates that they were the possessors, literally. They uh, were possessors of the Pledge of Abraham. They were possessors of the Covenant of Abraham. Genesis 14, 13. Okay. Now, anyway, these passages indicate that this is what a covenant is. Some of them are more plain. Some of them aren't. There's a passage somewhere in Scripture, everywhere in Scripture, that indicates that every one of these promises is sworn with an oath. The one to Noah and to the ark dwellers and to Abraham, and to Old Testament Israel, and to David, and to Jesus, and to the New Covenant. All of them. There are passages that indicate that they are all oath-bound promises. Now, what I've selected here is a few of these passages for you to consider with me. Um, Just look uh, for a minute at passage number 4. Genesis 15, 18 on page 1. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, okay, first of all, this covenant's not made in eternity. On that day, it's made in history. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham. There is such thing as a covenant between God and men. However you define covenant, if you get it so defined that there's no such thing as a real covenant between God and men, you have not defined it correctly. That's clear. On that day, God made a covenant with Abraham, saying, a covenant is made in words. It's verbal. And here's the substance of it. To your descendants, I've given this land. And then it goes on. Consider Exodus 19.5, passage number 8. Now, then if, and notice this word, if, if, If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be mine own possession from among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. And he goes on to say, it's not quoted here, but he goes on to say, and I will make you a kingdom of priests. A kingdom of priests. Does that sound familiar? And a holy nation. 
That is the promise of the old covenant. I will make you a kingdom of priests and a holy nation and you will have a perpetual relationship with me as my special people. But there's a key word in this old covenant promise. And what is it? If, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant. And what is the covenant? It's the covenant that they with their own ears heard the voice of God say. Never before in the history of the world did a people hear the voice of God speaking out of heaven. But that people did. And what voice, what did that voice say? That voice said the covenant. If you obey my voice and keep my covenant. Obey my voice, keep my covenant. And the voice comes out of heaven. And what does the voice say? Answer, the Ten Commandments. Um, and again, verse, uh, uh, verse or, or, or passage 13 makes that abundantly clear. So he declared to you, he declared, he declared to you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform. That is the Ten Commandments. And he wrote them on two tables of stone. See, this is not that hard to follow. In case you missed it from Exodus 19, there it is. Obey my voice. He declared to you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform. Well, that's the old covenant with Israel, the Ten Commandments. And along with the Ten Commandments, there were two documents associated with the old covenant. The first document was tables of stone, the Ten Commandments. There was another document. You can read about it. It was a book, the book of the law. It was a book that contained all of the ceremonies and the civil statutes that they were supposed to keep in the land of Canaan. So it was the law of the land and the land of the law. The law of the land and the land of the law. You cannot keep the book of the law unless you live in the land of Canaan. It is not possible to keep the book of the law unless you live in the land of Canaan. The book of the law was for Hebrew Israel under the old covenant living in the land. And that is made so abundantly clear. So you have two different things. And both of those things for them were the substance of that old covenant. Obey my voice. Now the voice didn't say all the things in the book. The voice only said the things on the table, the Ten Commandments. But afterwards, in the period of the wilderness, he gave them the book. The book of the law. The book started to be written and was sprinkled with blood in Deuteronomy or in, 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 in Exodus, and then it was completed on the plains of Moab, Deuteronomy. He gave them that book of the law. And that book of the law, together with the tables of stone, were the old covenant. Okay? Now the beautiful the beautiful thing about it is when, when the new covenant comes, how does the book and how do the tables relate? to Christian Israel. How do the book relate to Christian Israel? Well, we obviously can't keep the book because we don't live in the land. So how does the book relate to us? The book of the law. All the things written in the book. Well, New Testament tells us. How do the tables relate to us? What's written on the tables of stone? Jeremiah 31 tells us. This is the covenant. I will take my law and write it on their hearts. And that's not talking about the book. That's talking about the tables. And it's in conjunction with this promise about the tables that you will be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation if you keep it. And God, the beauty and genius of the new covenant is he makes us a kingdom of priests and a holy nation because he himself writes what's on those tables on our hearts. And that's the new covenant. What's on the tables of stone are written on the hearts of the people. So they do keep it because God sees to it. There's no if. God doesn't say, if, then I will write my law on your heart. But he says, here's the promise. And this is a better covenant and a better promise. Not if you keep it, then I will do this. But I will write it on your heart. And I will see to it that you keep. That's the better covenant, the better promise. Well, we'll go into that when we get through it. But right now, I want to show you from these verses about what the essence of a covenant is. Now, was this 
covenant relationship with them an oath, these promises that he made to them with these oath-bound promises. Let's look at passage number 20. Deuteronomy 29, 12. That you may enter into covenant with the Lord and into his oath, which the Lord your God is making this day. Now I, not with you alone, am I making this covenant and this oath. Um, let's see. Sorry? Passage 17? Oh, okay. All right. Oh, I have another one for that. I'm just, uh, yeah, 17 teaches that, that the covenant was sworn to Abraham. Um, what I want to look at is, let's see, First Chronicles 16, 15 and 16. Remember passage 27. Oh, no, just look on your sheets. Passage 27. Remember his covenant forever. The word which he commanded to a thousand generations, it's perpetuated. The covenant which he made with Abraham and his oath to Isaac. What? There's a page missing? Uh oh. Okay. I'll give it to you. Just a minute. No, I'll give it to you. I'll give it to you later. Oh, it's okay. I, I, I didn't realize you're missing that. I didn't even. I didn't notice. I see it now. All right. We'll stay away from passages 27 through 40. <laughs> but we can't totally stay away from passages 27 through 40. We have to look at uh, passage um, passage 36 and 35. They're very important. Psalm 89, please. Psalm 89. Psalm 89. Now look at this. Isn't this clear? Isn't this clear? Psalm 89, verse 3. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David my servant. And what's the substance? Thy seed will I establish forever and build up your throne to all generations. Now observe verse 34. My covenant I will not break nor alter the thing that is gone out of my lips. Once I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His seed shall endure forever and his throne as the sun before me. So what is God saying? When did God make that promise to David? It's recorded in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, that God promised David that his throne would continue forever. And he promised him with an oath. He swore that to David. And a covenant is a promise confirmed with an oath, an oath-bound promise. That's it. That's what it is. That's why I say to you that uh, Psalm 110, you got to look at this. That's, is that in here too? Yeah, that's, it's, it's in that. I guess it's in that uh, section. Psalm 110, verse 4. Psalm 110, verse 4. Observe the language. The Lord has sworn and will not repent. You are priests forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, there's nothing in the language here that explicitly says covenant. But if we know what the essence of a covenant is, then when we read this passage, we see that it's a covenant between God and Messiah. There's nothing in 2 Samuel 7 that says God's making a covenant with David. The word covenant's not used in 2 Samuel 7. But when Psalm 89 reflects on 2 Samuel 7, it says covenant. Similarly, there's nothing in Genesis 22, 16 to 18 that says God's making covenant with Abraham when he says, and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. There's nothing in there. The word covenant's not used there. But, the inspired writer in Acts looks back upon it and he says covenant. Why? Because he knows a covenant is an oath-bound promise. So covenant's not mentioned in Genesis 22. But Acts looks back on it and calls it covenant because it's an oath-bound promise. Covenant's not mentioned in 2 Samuel 7. 
But Psalm 39 looks back on it and calls it covenant because it's an oath-bound promise. And by the same clear way of thinking, if we understand what it means, when he says he swore an oath to Messiah and he promised him with an oath that he is priest forever, that's a covenant. That's what a covenant is. It's oath-bound promise that's perpetuated from generation to generation. It is a covenant. The word of the oath we read in Hebrews, which was after the law, appoints a son, perfected, forevermore. Okay. Now, one other passage that's crucial in this regard. I think this one, no, you don't. No, you don't have this one either. It's passage uh, 39. It's Isaiah 54, 9 and 10. Once again, there's nothing in uh, Isaiah 54, 9 and 10. Someone would say, well, you know, there's not, it says covenant, in Genesis 9, it says very clear that God's making a covenant with Noah and all his posterity that came out of the ark. But there's nothing in Genesis 9 that says anything about an oath. God doesn't say anything about an oath in Genesis 9. The word oath is not mentioned. But no, the word oath is not mentioned, but the word covenant is mentioned. So where covenant is mentioned, oath is implied. And where oath is mentioned, covenant is implied because a covenant is an oath, a solemn pledge, an oath-bound promise. Now, for example, where does it say that God swore an oath about the, uh, about the flood, that it would never happen again? Read, please, Isaiah 54, 9 and 10 with me. He's speaking about the everlasting covenant of peace with his people. And he says, for this is as the waters of Noah unto me, For as I have sworn. But there's nowhere in in Genesis that mentions swearing an oath. It just says covenant. But that's what it means. And that's why he says, As I have sworn that the waters of Noah shall no more go over the earth, so I have sworn that I will not be wroth with you or rebuke you. For the mountains may depart and the hills may be removed, but my loving kindness shall not depart from you neither shall my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord who has mercy on you. See, isn't that clear? Do you find it clear? You see, now when you read what the old Reformed theologians said, you're going to find out that many of the old Reformed theologians missed this and it caused all kinds of problems. For example, old John Gill said a covenant is a contract or a compact between equals. Covenant is a contract or a compact between equals involving stipulation and restipulation. And so there can't be a covenant between God and men. Read. There can't be because God and men are not equals. And they can't enter into restipulation and stipulation. So the only covenant that can actually be is between the Father and the Son before the foundation of the world. Because of the eye, that's the logical conclusion. If you really believe that a covenant is a compact between equals, a contract involving stipulation, restipulation. If you really believe that's what it is, and Gill's right, that's where that'll lead. But that's not what it is. And as we go through the various covenants, I'll show you, I trust, the nature of them and how they all grow out of oath-bound promise. You know, if, if a covenant is a compact between equals, how could there be a covenant between God and the ark dwellers? How could God be in covenant with the animals? How could God be in covenant with them? As he says he is, if that's what a a covenant actually is. There are all different kinds of models that have been suggested. What I'm saying right here is not novel to me, as you'll see when you read. The recognition of the importance of oath and covenant has been recognized by uh, Palmer Robertson, has been recognized by Mary, recognized by Klein, recognized by others. But it's very clear in the Bible that this is what it means. What about the, the, the problems with Abraham? We've already read one, but let me show you now. This is one you do have. Uh, New Testament passage one. Let's look at New Testament passage one. Look at that one. Now, unfortunately, you're going to have to turn to Luke 172 because what's written here is truncated. And it's the rest of the passage that's significant. Luke 172, Luke chapter 1, verse 72. To show mercy toward our fathers 
and to remember his holy covenant. And what is his holy covenant? This is what his holy covenant is. It is, quote, the oath which he swore unto Abraham, our father. His holy covenant equals the oath which he swore unto Abraham, our father. And then it opens up that oath, that the, the spiritual blessing of God's people. That spiritual blessing that comes to God's people in Christ. So a covenant is oath certified. It is a solemn, sworn, affirmed, confirmed, binding, oath certified promise. That's what a covenant is. That's true of covenants between men and it's true of covenants between God and men. That's why it doesn't have to be between equals. Because God is a superior and he can swear an oath to an inferior. He can even swear an oath to an unintelligent creature. God can do that because God can make a commitment and confirm it with an oath. As he did to all the creatures that were in the ark, even the ones that couldn't even understand it. God did it anyway. And God could make such a covenant because that's what it means. It doesn't have to be hammered out between equals. Second thing is a covenant, being an oath, is verbal. It has to do with words. It is not only a sworn commitment, it is also a verbal commitment. Genesis 15, 18. In that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, Exodus 19, 5, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant. Exodus 34, 28, and Deuteronomy 4, 13, the words of the covenant. Psalm 89, 34, I will not break my covenant, that thing which is gone out of my lips. It's verbal. And it's associated with favor, blessing, friendship, loyalty, giving, granting, bequeathing, peace, allegiance, alliance, those ideas. In Genesis 6.18 it says, Noah found favor. And Noah was distinguished from all of those who didn't find favor and were under enmity and wrath. In Deuteronomy 7, 2, it says, you shall show them no mercy or make no covenant with them. You don't make any commitment, any binding commitment to be at peace with them. Don't do that. In Psalm 25, 14, you don't show them or, 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 the, or show covenant and friendship. In Ezekiel 37, 25, and 26, is referred to as a covenant of Peace. So it has to do with gift unto thy seed have I given this land, favor and blessing, donation, gift. It has to do with friendship. It has to do with fellowship. It has to do with peace, depending on the context. It has to do with a favor from one who's speaking a blessing in a, in a promise with an oath to another. It can be between equals with men. It can be as a superior God speaking with blessing, favor, friendship, loyalty to men with an oath confirming it. So it's the opposite of a curse. It's not a curse. But it's a commitment of favor and friendship and donation and peace. I think you could go through those passages and find that that's true. So in summary, a covenant is an oath. An oath of favor is what you could call a solemn pledge. So a covenant is a solemn pledge of friendship or donation or of peace. And for that reason, I say to you that God's covenants are his solemn pledges of friendship, donation, and peace. Now, finally, along these lines, I've attempted to show you in this little diagram that I come up with on my Microsoft Word, not the whole picture here with Noah and the ark dwellers, but just this bottom half of the picture from Abraham onward, which is the core of covenant theology, God's covenants with his people. The Hebrew economy of the people of God and the Christian economy of the people of God, the Abrahamic covenant, Old Covenant, Davidic covenant, in the Hebrew economy, the two servant covenants and the saved community covenant, the Messianic covenant, New Covenant, in the Christian economy. You have Hebrew Israel. You see little dotted lines inside Hebrew Israel. Those are Abraham's spiritual children. So there's a little dotted line. 
That little dotted line of Abraham's spiritual children inside the society of Abraham's physical children, that society comes into focus with Jesus. And what comes out in the new covenant is a society that is made up of Abraham's spiritual children, that is Jesus' posterity. The old covenant with Hebrew Israel was established in a wilderness generation from successive generations until the seed should come in the final generation to whom the promise had been made. The new covenant with Christian Israel was established in the apostolic generation through successive generations of Jesus' posterity who are born through the gospel until the second coming of Christ and the final generation when all is consummated and completed in glory. That's what I wanted to set out to you. And these covenants, they have some characteristics. They are historical. They are made at a specific place and time in history, as you can see through the texts that have been given. That's true of all of them. They are formal. They are ratified by an oath. And they are perpetual. They are established organically with generations after generations after generations. In every one of the covenants, that's true. They are distinct and multiple. They're not, there's not just one covenant, but there's more than one covenant. The Abrahamic covenant is not the old covenant, and the Davidic covenant is not the old covenant, and the Messianic covenant is not the Davidic covenant. What did God promise Abraham? In your seed, all the families of the earth be blessed, and they will inherit the land. What did he promise Israel? If you obey my voice, you'll be my special people in a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. What did he promise David? Your son will sit on my throne forever. What did he promise Jesus? Your priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. What did he promise Christian Israel? I will write my law on their heart and they will all know me and I will forgive their sins and their iniquities. I will remember no more. It's not the same promises, but... This new covenant is a better covenant, not with the same promise, but based on better promises. Surely it's a better promise. I will write my law in their heart and they will all know me. Then if you obey my voice, then you will be a kingdom of priests. The one promise is good and the other is better. So they're not the same covenant. They're distinct historical covenants. Distinct recipients, distinct promises, but they're all united. They're all evangelically united. As Paul says in Ephesians 2.12, these are the covenants of the promise. And the promise, these, 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 these are evangelically and spiritually united. They're all united in that they're all connected with the same promise of Christ and of salvation by grace through faith in Christ. They're all connected with that same promise of deliverance from sin. They don't all bear the same relationship to it, but they're all connected to it. And they're all unified evangelically by it. These covenants, these historical covenants, are the progressive unfolding and revealing and disclosing of that glorious promise to save people from sin in Jesus Christ. In thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Now that's, I think, what Paul's thinking about in Ephesians 2 when he's talking about the covenants of the promise, because he says the Gentiles were strangers from those covenants of the promise. But that that promise that's covenantalized to Abraham here in Genesis 3, if I can use that word, that promise goes all the way back to Genesis 3 and verse 15, which we'll study, God willing. And that promise has been called historically, you know what it's been called, that promise, that God would save in Christ, a a covenant of grace. There's one final thing I would say to you about this. Covenant, these, these historical covenants are not only rooted in this one promise of Genesis 3.15, but there are a couple of passages that teach that the roots of these, of these historical covenants go back even further. There's passages that teach that the roots of these, though the word covenant is never used about Genesis 3.15, the promise that I know of, the, the word covenant is never used that I know of either. There's a debate about it. We'll get into it. But here in Genesis 2.16, about this either, but explicitly. And then you got to go keep going further back. There's a root that goes all the way back to Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. 
The connection with Genesis 2.16 is shown over here. This is what I would call the creation prohibition. I'm almost done. And the connection here is in Romans 5. We'll look into this when we talk about what's been called the covenant of works. Romans 5, 12 to 19, indicates a parallel between Adam before the fall and the work of Christ. That Adam was a type, according to Paul in Romans 5, 14, of the one who is to come, Jesus. You have a picture, Adam and his posterity and the tree and Jesus and his posterity and his obedience. So there's a, there's a parallel established by God. And this creation prohibition and the whole framework or economy of the creation prohibition, which has been called the covenant of works, this is by Paul said to be a picture here. So here's the mystery of God, that God gives us a picture of salvation in Christ even before the fall. Because God planned the end from the beginning. There's another passage that pushes us all the way back to the beginning, before the foundation of the world. And that's a passage like 1 Peter 1, 19 and 20, which speaks about Christ and being redeemed, these people, being redeemed by the blood of Christ, who was foreknown before the foundation of the world, all the way back to in the beginning. You have the plan of God. And that plan of God before the foundation of the world, includes all this. And especially, it includes God's predestination or decree concerning Jesus. And that eternal counsel of God, or his decree of predestination concerning Jesus, has been commonly called the covenant of redemption. So you have three roots to these historical covenants. And they are in eternity the eternal counsel concerning redemption, the predestination of Christ. In history, the creation prohibition concerning the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the one and the many, and the emancipation proclamation. And these things have been termed the covenant of redemption, the covenant of works, and the covenant of grace. And we'll take time to study those three roots. I want to study the concept of covenant first, and what a covenant is, because then... We can, as we study these things, we can decide whether these. It's clear that, you know, these three these three things are the roots of all of this that God does. That's clear. But the first usage of covenant is not Genesis one or Genesis two or Genesis three. But the first use of covenant in the Bible is here in Genesis six, speaking about this historical covenant made with His righteous servant Noah. Well, I'm done for tonight. You have questions, you have comments. Anything you want to say about any of that? Before we move on. Now that's the, I've covered, believe it or not, what I said I was going to cover. I covered the general introduction to God's covenants, lectures one and two. We just finished part three of the introduction, the biblical revelation of God's covenants. Now tomorrow evening, we've got a lot to cover. Eternal counsel of redemption, creation prohibition, covenant of grace, and Noahic covenant. That's a lot of stuff. But And I can't deal with it all tomorrow night. Obviously, I'm going to have to give you handouts, which I've given you. I've given you handouts on the covenant of works. I don't have handout for the covenant of redemption or covenant of grace. I'll deal with those in the Noahic covenant in the three hours, God willing. Any questions about what we saw tonight? Tried to put it into perspective for you? Mike? The promise, as I understand it, is the promise of Christ. It's the promise of Christ and salvation by Christ. To put it very specifically, I, my own judgment, he's thinking of a very specific promise given to Abraham. In thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. He's thinking of the promise of Genesis 22:18 in that context. Because it's from that promise and this whole economy of covenants associated with it, the Abrahamic covenant, the uh, old covenant, and the Davidic covenant, all those covenants of the Old Testament associated with it, they, the Gentiles were strangers from that whole economy of the people of God. And that, that was founded on the promise of, uh, of Christ. That's what, that's what I think he's talking about, Mike, in that, con, in that passage. That's what I believe it means. I, I have with me here the, 
statements of various exegetes that basically would agree with that. I could read to you uh, Edie or Hodge, but I, you know, there's really so much time. Anyway, that, but exegetically, I believe that's what that's referring to. But in principle, it, that, that same promise is found all the way back here in Genesis 3.15. Yeah. There's, there's a... Um, uh, did Jamie answer that? Yeah, just, um, you mentioned the covenant of redemption. Yes. Do you distinguish between the covenant of redemption and what you uh, name here the messianic covenant? Absolutely, yes. Okay. The covenant of redemption is, has to do with something that took place in eternity before the foundation of the world. Messianic covenant, according to these passages, has to do with something that happens in history with the resurrected Christ. Now, there's clearly, there's very clearly an intimate, close, bound connection between those two One things. One close out of the other. Absolutely. That's it. In fact, that's one of the questions that's going to be on the test, is the relationship between those two things, Jamie. Okay. That's on the test. If that's important. But the, but the one is an eternal counsel of God made in eternity. The other is a historical oath of God sworn in history. That's, uh, yes. Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, and thou art priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Yes? Um, the uh, Noahic covenant, in, is it true to say that um, it's not a redemptive covenant? It's never called that. Right. It's, it, there's, a, there's a sense of rescue in it. But the word redemption, in my understanding, is reserved for these two rescues of the people uh, of God. Yeah, so would it be true to say then that really uh, there, there's something distinct about Abraham from Abraham forward with regard right. to the covenants that you... In other words, the Noahic covenant doesn't include the same promise. It's more... Could you call it a covenant of common grace? You could call it all kinds of things. I've been wrestling with years of what kind of name to call it. Yeah, yeah, but there, it this, this is, a, in, in one sense, though, Jeff, this is a covenant of common grace, too. The old covenant is, too. It's redemptive common grace, but it's still common grace. I mean, that, but anyway, yeah, you could call it that. It, it's hard to come up with a name of it. I just call it the Noahic economy. But it's distinct from the economies of the people of God. Now, the importance of these two should be clear. I mean, our Bible's not divided into three parts. It's not divided into an Noahic Testament, an Old Testament, and a New Testament. That's not there. There's two Testaments. Not three. Two. So, obviously, the prominence comes to these covenants with the people of God and the bodies of revelation associated with those uh, two redemptive works of God in, in delivering his people. But that, that's where the prominence comes. and So that's why I, would I be, treat it that way. Would it be proper to say that the relationship of the Noahic covenant to the whole unfolding of redemptive history, uh, of course, the Noahic covenant is typical. Yes. But it also, would it be true, proper to say that it establishes the stable framework of a, of a preserved world? It would. Through which the promise of salvation is brought to pass. Absolutely. That's very well said. As a matter of fact, it reminds me of what we wrote here. Yes, here you go. This is from chapter 7a on paragraph 2. It's been changed around a little bit. From this deliverance, talking about Noah and covenant, our entire existence derives order and stability and sinners are given incentive to repent and we obtain a graphic picture of God's deliverance of believers from sin and wrath through Jesus Christ. So yes, it does. This has a purpose. It gives the entire existence of life in this now world order and stability. So it had a very clear purpose in establishing a framework. I call it the shell or the... the, um, the container, or whatever you want to say it, because it's within that shell that God deals with his people. And it's a covenantal shell. You could call a covenant of common grace. Common, God is committed to continue in common grace to people, and he's, he's sworn an oath to that effect. It sets a capstone over the blessing of be fruitful and multiply in Genesis 9, 1 to 7, as hopefully we'll see tomorrow. God willing. Yeah, I wrestle with what to call it. I'm open for ideas. Further comments or questions? 
If not, let's close our time in prayer. And then I need to give you that sheet, Tom. Our Father, we thank you for what you have revealed to us in your holy word. We, we pray that you would give us humble and clear minds to be able to read it and understand it as you intend it to be understood. We pray that you would write the truth of it upon our hearts. And we pray that you would use these